Hello everyone. We are studying the Gospel of Mark for our reflection in this liturgical year B. However, for five weeks, from the 17th to 21st Sunday, we read chapter 6 of the Gospel of John in which Jesus reveals himself as the bread of life. Today, we resume the study of the Gospel of Mark from the 7th chapter. While Jesus was really busy preaching, teaching and healing throughout Galilee, some Jews, particularly the Pharisees and scribes, were constantly watching Jesus, hoping to find some fault with him or some reason to discredit him. One such instance is today's Gospel story. Friends, Mark writes that some Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem once found Jesus' disciples eating without washing their hands and asked Jesus why his disciples failed to observe the tradition of the elders. Friends, we must note three things here. 1. The Pharisees and scribes were the powerful and influential sects of Judaism at the time of Jesus. 2. These two groups of people considered themselves righteous because of their strict observance of the law of Moses. 3. The fact they were from Jerusalem matters a lot because it would turn out to be a place of Jesus' suffering and death. Friends, to better understand the confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees and scribes, we need a quick review of the cultural context and purity laws of the Jews at the time of Jesus. The tradition of the washing of hands dates back to the time of Moses, when temple priests, before performing any ritual, were required to wash their hands and make themselves pure and ready to offer a sacrifice. But then, the Pharisees gradually inserted this ritual washing into the routines of daily life and wanted all Jewish people to observe it. Some of the key times to wash the hands include before prayer, when leaving a cemetery, after using latrine or bathroom, prior to going up to bless people, before eating and so on. But the most important of these washings is the washing of hands before eating or handling any food. Even today, Orthodox and traditional Jews look upon the washing prior to eating with such rigidity that those who willfully neglect its practice are said to make themselves liable to excommunication. However, the mere fact that only some of Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands before eating tells us that not all Jews at the time of Jesus followed the same practice. However, Mark writes that all Jews were keeping the tradition of washing their hands carefully before they ate, purifying themselves of their return from marketplaces and cleansing cooking utensils and beds. Friends, now Jesus knew that the question that the Pharisees had posed to him was simply implied accusation and criticism. They did not simply ask Jesus why his disciples did not wash their hands before eating or how he regarded the practice of hand washing. Rather, they accused his disciples of breaking the tradition of the elders. They claimed that all the traditions passed down through successive generations are oral laws and that they have authority equal to the written law of Moses which came from God. Effectively then, they were saying that his disciples violated not just a human tradition but a tradition of divine origin, a command of God. Friends, Jesus responded by strongly denouncing them. He quoted the prophet Isaiah in reference to such people, saying, Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, hypocrites? These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching us doctrines, human precepts. You disregard God's commandment, but cling to human tradition. Friends, by saying that Isaiah was right when he had prophesied about the religious leaders and teachers of the law, Jesus was saying that the prophet's words apply just as much as to Jesus' contemporaries as they did to the people of Isaiah's time 800 years earlier. Friends, what had happened 
among God's people in Isaiah's days was now happening again during Jesus' ministry. They were hypocrites, were only merely honoring God with their lips, while their hearts were far from Him. Their worship was vain, fruitless and fertile. They were strictly enforcing the legalistic traditions, but were neglecting God's teachings on understanding, compassion, mercy, tolerance, gentleness, justice, faithfulness, patience, forgiveness and love. Friends, and then Jesus turned to all who had gathered around him and said, Nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person, but the things that come out from within are what defile. From within people, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from within and they defile. Friends, in other words, Jesus was saying that whatever they practice, whichever traditions they did or did not uphold, they were not the things that by themselves would make them belong to God's kingdom or inherit eternal life or obtain peace and joy. He reminded them that unlike food that simply passes through one's system, that which is produced in the heart affects the whole person. For it is from within, from the heart, that evil intentions come. That is to say, the heart is the center of human will and rationality. The heart is the place from which all kinds of intentions arise. Friends, finally, Jesus concluded the teaching with a list of things capable of making a person impure or corrupting a person's heart. Some, like theft, murder and adultery, are actions and others like greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance and folly, or character traits and attitudes. All come, Jesus said, from disordered or corrupted hearts. Defilement dwells deep within. The source of defilement is more internal than external. It is more about who a person is than about the food or filth a person avoids. Friends, what is the message for us? 1. Jesus neither rejected nor denied the validity of either the law of Moses in general or its individual commandments, nor denounced worship practices, nor did he say that they are unimportant. He only rebuked the people for their failure to uphold it or the distortion of tradition in order to circumvent the law and engage in empty worship practices. Friends, some people, when using such texts to discourage people who are engaged in rituals and devotions or dismissing all outward religious practices and traditions as vain worship, meaningless or a waste of time. For them, scripture alone is sufficient for our faith in Jesus. But Christ's words in the Gospel today teach us that both the scriptures and traditions are important to our faith in Him. Friends, we, Catholic Christians, have inherited lots of religious customs, ritual signs and practices. There are ceremonies and sacraments such as baptism, the Eucharist, prayers for the sick, holy orders, marriage, confirmation, confession or penance, daily practices such as prayers at table, bedside and other times, observances such as regular such attendance, fasting, giving to charity, novenas, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, sacramentals such as rosary beads, holy images, statues, pictures, holy water, incense, candles, gestures and postures such as making the sign of the cross with the holy water upon entering the church, standing, kneeling, sitting, bowing, during prayers or mass, etc. All these are so meaningful and help us express our faith in God and worship God. However, we must, as Jesus says, worship Him in spirit and truth. That means our worship must be reverential and wholehearted, not dull and half-hearted, internal, not external, simple, not ritualistic, real and sincere, not fake, serious, 
not flippant, humbling, not boastful, clean and thankful. Because certain religious practices have become so much a part of our lives that they become just habits with no meaning attached to them. Friends, during the Mass, we can stand, kneel and bow to express our reverence, honor, humility and obedience to God and still not really show our reverence and honor internally. We can sit to listen and meditate on the Word of God and still cling to worldly thoughts and feelings. We can pray standing up or sitting down or kneeling and still never really pray. Upon entering the church, we can dip a finger in holy water and do the sign of the cross to remind ourselves of our own baptism and to free ourselves from uncleanness and still have sin in our heart. We can sing every song in the book to praise and thank God and still not really giving our thanks and praises to Him. We can read and hear the word of God and still not know God. We can worship in beautiful churches all our life and never really experience the holy ground. We can receive the body and blood of Christ every time and still never believe in the presence of God in the Eucharist or commune with God. However, today's gospel is a reminder that in the event of someone breaking a tradition or doctrine, the teaching of God to show mercy, love, compassion, understanding and forgiveness takes precedence over all traditions and practices, for God is more concerned with who we are on the inside than our outward ceremonial gestures. 2. Friends, Jesus neither dismisses the issue of defilement as insignificant, nor does he denounce hygienic practices before eating or when handling food. We must care for our heart, our physical heart as well as our spiritual heart. However, Jesus' words remind us that we must take greater care, though, of our spiritual heart because from within comes all kinds of evil acts and thinking and which in turn makes us unclean and affects us drastically and robs us of joy and peace. 3. Friends, Jesus did not say, that our hearts are utterly corrupt and wholly polluted. Plenty of good thoughts and intentions come from our hearts. So, let us free ourselves from distractions and unnecessary arguments about external acts and signs of our faith and focus more on preparing our hearts and thereby our entire selves for the kingdom of God. Amen. God bless you.